thank you for being patient. I'd like to call this meeting of the Board of Education to order. Please rise for the pledge. Led by Mr. Sanderson. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Item E, adoption and approval of the agenda. So Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Item F, special recognitions and presentations. Our first item are our student reports. This evening we have extra reports. Um, if I could have uh, the principal of Pendergrove School come forward and introduce her students who are going to join our junior high representatives in their student reports. Okay, I would like to introduce two of our students, Veronica Sandoval and Jacob Anderson, but before we get them started, I'd like to introduce their parents as well. We have Joel and uh, Veronica Sandoval and their siblings, and we have Paul and Jennifer Anderson and also Jacob's siblings over there. Hello, we are here to tell you about our school, Pangrove Elementary. We are sixth graders and our names are Jacob Anderson and Veronica Sandoval. I came to Pembroke School when I was a third grader. I was very shy and I remember being scared, but I made a friend named Jacob and he's still my friend. I came to school in kindergarten and I remember my teacher was Miss Arturio. I spoke Spanish and English and was surprised everyone only spoke English. One of the reasons we like our school is that we have many activities during the school year. We have our back to school barbecue at Pembroke Park our Halloween Carnival, and our Festival, Festival of the Arts, which has a talent show and an art show for students. We also have skate nights every month, our open house, pasta feeds, and many class plays and performances. My favorite is the talent show, which this year will be in March. My favorite activity is field day, which is the last week of school. Every class spends a day doing activities including egg toss, tug of war, rope climbing, and the rope climbing. And the warm weather is a great way to get ready for summer vacation. We are lucky to have field trips at Pembroke School. Some of our favorites are the overnight field trips we have taken to Fort Ross Mutual Island. In May, all the sixth graders will go to Camp Navarro for a week of outdoor education. We will leave on Sunday and return on Friday and spend a week hiking and learning about science outside in nature. We work all year to raise money for camp, but it will be worth it because we know we'll have a great time. This year we had pasta feeds, recycled cans for camp, sold ice cream after school, and sold water at the Pembroke Parade on the 4th of July. This is our first year going to Camp Navarro, but we are excited because all the other camp campers will be from old Adobe schools. Some of us are going to Kenilworth next year, so we will make some friends at camp before next year. We have intramural sports at our school at recess. We've had the soccer tournament, the basketball tournament, the volleyball tournament, tournament, and the football tournament. The teams are organized by Mr. Zeiler and have 4th, 5th, and 6th grade students on them. We will soon begin practicing for Westside Relays, which happens in May this year. We will see kids from all over the schools in Petaluma and will compete in events such as 50-yard dash, shot put, and 4x4 relay. We have a community service requirement for our 5th and 6th grade students. Each of us is asked to perform 10 hours of community service. Some kids work at animal shelters, some visit elderly people, and some work at school with special events. This year we both worked as reading mentors with younger students on our campus. The last half hour of the school day we read with younger students. We try to think of our community so this year we've had two food drives. We've collected over 2,000 cans and boxes, boxes and donated them all to Cox. They both have favorite subjects. Mine is art and I especially like the Art Joseph program where we do special art projects. We are both in chorus and just had our winter concert. We are sixth graders so we will be leaving Pengrove School in June. Our last week of school, we will have a promotion ceremony in the evening where we invite families and friends to celebrate with us. The next day, we will have a swim day at KOA. We will say goodbye to the school we have been at since we were small. This is some information about our school. We invite you to come to Peg Grove and visit. We'd be proud to show you around. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your hard work.
work and sharing all of that. I noticed in our calendar that you have an art show coming up this month. Is that correct? <coughs> so hopefully we'll get a chance to come by and see. Thank you very much. Thanks. Well done. Okay, and um, our student representative from Kenilworth Junior High. Hello, my name is Monique Ells and I'm here representing Kenilworth. First, I'll talk about sports. Wrestling has just begun and we have a really good team this year. Our girls' volleyball season has just ended and the girls did, did great. Our boys' basketball team has been going on and we're really proud of them. Recently, our school held the second academic rally of the school year. Many awards were given out along with lots of prizes. Over the past week, our seventh graders have been participating in Challenge Day. Many of them come back with changed minds and attitudes. Last Friday, we held our Valentine's Day dance. Students danced in our multi, which was decorated with pink and red decor. Next Friday is our Spirit Day, Cluster Day. Students can choose a friend to dress alike with. Over the next few weeks, Kenilworth has and will be participating in Pennies for Patients, an organization to help the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society. Placed in each classroom is a box to raise money for this cause. Right now, we have approximately $1,500, and our goal is $2,500. Last week, we sold Cupid Grants, and all the profits will be donated to an organization of our choice. Leadership is currently re researching charities, and, we'll, and we will soon decide on which one to donate to. Just this week, Kenilworth has started a composting program. We try to motivate the students by playing games, raffling items, and educating them on KTV. All is going well, and we hope that our compost pile will begin soon. Thanks for listening. Thank you. And our representative from Petaluma Jr. Oh. <laughs> Good evening. I feel like I'm growing younger by the second year. Well. Petaluma Junior High School site report. Our site reps and alternates are all out this evening. They are doing sports, cheer, tutoring, other activities. I'm sure nothing at all to do with Valentine's Day. <laughs> In the sporting life, track and wrestling signups have gone well and practice for both will start soon. Boys basketball ends February 23rd next week and when I left Petaluma Junior this evening earlier, um, I have to say Kenilworth was definitely beating Petaluma Junior a few minutes ago. Um, so our crosstown rivals are doing well against us this evening. The renovation of our field and baseball areas is almost complete and we are approaching the final punch list, as John likes to say, in time for the opening day of Little League on March 3rd. Maintenance and operation landscaping crews have been clearing brush uh, along Western and Bantam, and it all looks absolutely amazing. In the area of music, support programs, Rock and Roll 101, the Philharmonic, as another, are both after-school music programs led by Preston Bailey and are well attended. Uh, with the Philharmonic, if you're not familiar with the Philharmonic, it's a wonderful program that brings in um, students, music students, elementary music students from uh, Petaluma City Schools as well as out-of-district schools. And it's a program that gives those high-achieving students who really want to practice hard and achieve a different level of music an opportunity to do so. So I think that's a great program that Preston's done these years. Let's see, and if they attend um, six out of eight of those different uh, practices, they get to play the Giants game in May, which is a lot of fun on the field with the choir. Sign-ups for Los Golandrinas, a Mexican folkloric dance troupe, has 30 sign-ups this year, the largest group ever. They will be performing at local schools and also the Petaluma Junior High School Open House and the community building activity called Noche de Fiesta, which occurs in spring. Career exploration for 7th and 8th graders is well underway with two guest speakers, a Kaiser nurse and a solar engineer scheduled to speak with interested students at Petaluma Junior at lunch in the next couple of weeks. We are also lucky um, recipients of the Middle School Career Exploration Grant, which um, other schools in the area have as well. And this is from SCO, it's administered by Dan Blake, and we're quite lucky to have about $6,000 in funding for career-related um, items for our department, such as a video camera for history day use and a presentation table, excuse me, for independent living. We will also soon be administering the Cooter Career Exploration Inventory and elective classes. In academics, in recent Honor Roll and Renaissance Award assemblies, more than about 50% of our Petaluma Junior High School students have received certificates for achievement of 3.0 or 4.0. 
Um, History Day projects are currently being researched by our sixth, seventh, and eighth grade students, with the topic being the individual in history. These projects are always displayed at open house. This year, that'll be May 2nd. And uh, let me see, also a major impact grant was, uh, was uh, earned by our department. So we have four new interactive whiteboards that have been installed. And um, more voice amplification systems and Elmo's, of course. Um, teachers say over and over again that they can't believe the difference that these, uh, these items for technology have made in their instruction. They just can't imagine how they ever did without them before. As you know, we're getting our STAR testing schedule put together. That'll be coming together shortly. And we're up about 40 students in terms of our enrollment from last year or the next year. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very interesting. Okay, and we have one more presentation. Um, Ron Everett, our Director of Human Resources, will introduce Loretta Cruz Ma Maggie or Maggie? Loretta, I always get that right. Maggie. Cruz Maggie, thank you. I, I apologize. <laughs> to who will introduce? Good call. Good call. Good call. Good call. Good call. Great pleasure. Um, four times a year to recognize one of our wonderful employees, and so I would like to invite Loretta Cruz Michael, yeah. the president of CSEA up front to announce their employee of the quarter. Thank you. We have to get a little better spiel though, a little better look because people are always scared when we, when we walk down the hall to oh, tell no. Stacy. Oh. <laughs> Ron and myself oh, and no. Linda oh, and Eric Backman and she kind of was like, is everything okay? <laughs> <laughs> And then the HR watches. <laughs> yeah. Never leave with them. I know. <laughs> Good evening, board members, staff, and community. It's my pleasure to introduce the next CSCA member of the quarter. For those of you who don't know who classified people are, we are everybody at the school that isn't a teacher. We're the custodians, the clerical staff in the office, the food service people, the bus drivers, the maintenance workers that are working at Pelham Junior High. So um, it's my pleasure to introduce the next CSEA member of the quarter, which is Stacy Fabian. Would you like to come up? Stacy, welcome. Pelham City Schools, you could turn around, and then that way people can see you. <laughs> Pelham City Schools is campus supervisor at Casa Grande High. In April of 1996, she became their clerk typist. Later that year, she became an instructional assistant in special education. And in 2006, she began her current position of student records clerk, also at CASA. Now I'd like to share with you some of the reasons Stacy is receiving this honor. Stacy is flexible, having kept her office running in the midst of changes. Many little changes. The students see her as a safe haven as she is very approachable and has a kind personality. Stacy is a very hard worker and helps out the school nurse and also helps children with their medical issues. Not only is she good, a good employee, but an asset to our student body. Stacy goes the extra mile to inform staff of potential student needs. She communicates clearly and concisely. Stacy is Casa Grande. She helps out at athletic events. She also collects prom dresses throughout the year to give to underprivileged girls who otherwise wouldn't be able to attend. She always has a warm smile and makes all the students feel loved and cared for. So. On behalf of the chapter, I'd like to give you this little certificate, and this is your gift card from Macy's. When we have the Students of the Month, which we don't have at this particular meeting, we often acknowledge the family that supports the students, so I don't know if you would like to acknowledge your family that might be here. To this is my husband, Tate, and my daughter, Alexis. <laughs> recognize that some of our students may have homework or other things to attend. We have plenty of more agenda to go through. Um, you are welcome to stay, but I will take a very short recess in case you need to leave to get home to your activities.
Services will introduce Marla Stewart. So. Yes, so I'd like to introduce Marla Stewart. Marla is here to talk about the upstream project that is going on in Sonoma County. Um, and she is the director of the MSW division of um, the Sonoma County Health and Human Services. Okay. okay. Thank you very much, Jane. Good evening, uh, board members um, and staff. Thank you very much for this opportunity to visit with you and talk about the Upstream Investments Policy Initiative. And thank you to Jane for the invitation to come this evening. I am Marla Stewart. I work for the County of Sonoma for the Human Services Department, and I'm the manager of the Upstream Investments Initiative. Um, and you may have heard about this initiative. It's a county-sponsored, community-wide policy initiative, um, and it has three objectives. So this will be quick and won't take me very long to tell you about these. The first objective is investing early. The second objective is investing wisely. And the third objective is investing together. So just quickly about each of those. Investing early, uh, this initiative is all about prevention-focused strategies um, and work and uh, an effort to just collaboratively do as much prevention as we can do um, and to dedicate the resources, every resource that we can, towards prevention-focused policies and strategies. And so we as a county have made a commitment to doing everything a little bit earlier whenever we can, and we invite your partnership in doing the same thing, making a commitment to spend your resources as a school district and just getting a little bit earlier every place we can, trying to get ahead of those challenges that our children and our families face in our community. That's investing early. Investing wisely is a commitment to evidence-based practice. Um, we know that there is a lot of uh, strategies and activities that are effective. There's a lot of research now about what is effective. And we really um, don't have the resources to spend on strategies that are not effective. And our families that we work with don't have the time for us to be providing services to them that may not be effective. Um, and so investing wisely is really about making a conscious, um, committed uh, commitment to evidence-based practice. Um, and what you can do practically here is to submit your programs to the portfolio of model upstream programs. This is a local clearinghouse. We invite submissions of programs. We have a unbiased um, review process. It's pretty rigorous. And when programs get on the portfolio, it's basically a stamp of approval that shows that that program um, is evidence-based, is using data, and it has the highest likelihood of being effective. Now, Jane put together a list of programs. You guys are already on the portfolio. There's five different programs that you're participating in on the portfolio. So I want to thank you for that and congratulate you on that. And I have to, I'll just note while that's going around, um, we've really um, built on the work of First Five in this area. And Jane's been very involved with First Five over the years. And First Five has done a great job in our community promoting evidence-based practice for um, zero through five. And we're really trying to just extend that through all of our program areas in the community. So you can see these five programs, Avance, Project Success, Triple P, Safe School Ambassadors, and Schools of Hope, which are all programs that you're involved in already. But I'm sure there are many other evidence-based programs and strategies that you're implementing. I mean, in education, there's all kinds of evidence about what's effective. And so there's many opportunities for you to submit your programs and kind of get that stamp of approval um, and being on the local clearinghouse. So that's investing early, investing wisely. The third part about Upstream is investing together. And this is really a commitment to collective impact. And what you can do here is you can submit a resolution of alignment to Upstream, which is a way that you as a board are making a formal and public commitment to these uh, principles, investing early, focusing on prevention, investing wisely, a commitment to evidence-based practice, and then investing together. And 
you know, the programs that you already have on the portfolio show that you do have a commitment to investing together. I mean, Schools of Hope is a very collaborative activity. Safe Schools Ambassadors is a very collaborative activity. Um, Project Success is collaborative. Avance um, is a program that you must be offering in your sites. Is that right? It's, yeah, yeah. being offered at McKinley and right. at McDowell for right. um, parents of zero to three-year-olds. So you're clearly already very committed to zero-year-olds. 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 <laughs> You're already very committed, obviously, to investing together, which is great. Um, one thing that we have in Upstream is we have 21 indicators of success. And part of what we're asking you to do is to kind of sign on to doing activities that promote those indicators of success. Five of them are related, or four of them are related specifically to education. Um, doing a better job at third grade reading, third grade math, high school completion, and then getting kids into higher education. So those are the ones specifically related to education. So why should you participate? Well, I can think of four reasons why you might want to participate. The first one is that it'll, it, it's a way for you to make an official and public commitment to upstream principles. Second is that participating in the portfolio is a way that you can really promote outcomes-based practice throughout your school district. Um, it's a way that you can encourage your staff to really be thinking about evidence-based practice. And when um, an organization wants to submit to the portfolio, we provide a lot of technical assistance. So the actual process of getting on the portfolio is a way for you to expand your capacity to do evidence-based practice within the district. Um, third, as funders, and I know you're funders, you provide funding for different organizations, I'm assuming. As a funder, if you use the portfolio as one of your screen criteria, um, you are making a commitment to using your money wisely. So we have um, at least three funders locally that I'm already aware of, the county, United Way, and First Five, who have started using the upstream portfolio in their RFPs that they put out. And then fourth, um, by doing a resolution of alignment and really kind of signing on to upstream, it's a way that you can communicate with your community about providing educational services that have the best possibility of success. Upstream investments is fiscally sound. It's a way that we can tell our community with, that we're making good use of taxpayer dollars, that we're investing our dollars into the things that have the highest chance of being effective and are going to do the best for our community. So we welcome your partnership, um, and we look forward to a resolution of alignment and more programs on the portfolio. Thank you. Thank you. So what we'll be doing is we have the draft resolution of alignment. Um, we will be putting that on your agenda in okay. the future. Let me okay. okay. discuss and think about that. Okay? Okay. 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 Thank you very much. Sure. Thank you. All right. Item G, approval of the means of January 24th, 2012. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Um, we have a category of comments from the public, um, and I have three speaker cards but I believe they are re in response to a discussion item we have on the agenda. So I am going to skip this section at this point, if that seems reasonable, and just go on to the public comment uh, regarding that discussion item. Item I, because we don't have any other public here, <laughs> it appears to be um, who might speak. Item I, uh, report on activities and correspondence of school board members. Been a busy couple of weeks. Uh, several of us attended the boy and Steve attended the Boys and Girls Club Crab Feet, a uh, big community event. Um, attendance at volleyball games, basketball games, um, and the adult school education graduation. Thank you. Um, and then uh, the sad um, memorial service for Sarah Wadsworth, our French teacher from Petaluma High School, who passed away recently. So um, it was a, an event that uh, the students and staff and, and the board really appreciated. Okay. Uh, item J, the approval of the consent agenda by consolidated motion. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Um, we have one whole item under administration and human resources, item two. Uh, the official 2012 Delegate Assembly ballot rec recommended motion that the board vote and record on the original CSBA ballot the selection of one CSBA Delegate Assembly member for Region 3A. Um, in our packet a couple of weeks ago, we received um, information about two candidates. We have uh, that information in our packet tonight as well. 
Um, has anybody had a chance to, I mean, obviously you've had a chance to review these. Does anybody have any questions or, um, I guess we have to have a motion first, but we need to discuss the candidates um, and if anybody has a recommendation. I do not know either. I don't know either. I don't know either one of them. I don't know either one. I had briefly, uh -huh. not just briefly, I met him once last time. Um, I was looking for guidance for you and Matt a while as to <laughs> qualifications and your opinions on whether. I, I, did, I did like what he wrote. Um, yeah, I'd I, like to get answers. Mm -hmm. I mean, not that I didn't like hers, but right. I was a little more partial to his. Right. Um, my, my perspective is he seemed to have a little bit more experience with um, the activities that a person in this position, it, it would help a um, person in this position. But again, I'm, I'm open to suggestions. Would you so, like a motion to vote for Ed Gelati? I would need to have a motion, yes. Oh, motion to vote Ed Gelati. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Edge of Lardy. Okay. And the rest is consent. And now we are on to discussion items. We have quite a few under business services. I had one, I just had a question about um, item 11 having to do with the, yeah. let's see, that's page 56. Mm -hmm. The reclassification of the fund balance. Right. Is this something that's going to cause you a lot more time, or is it? Mm. I'm, I'm just concerned that in reviewing this policy that. Yeah. No, I I, I don't think so. Um, basically, we'll pretty much keep operating the way we have. An example of this change would be um, one of the components in our current fund balance that we always share with you mm -hmm. is the restricted, um, what we have self-restricted uh, for retiree benefits. Right. So we will have to have you recognize that as a, a formal line item. It's something we've been doing anyway. Right. Okay. So um, in the, yeah, I don't think it's going to really change very much. Okay, I just wanted to make sure that we weren't, I know that there's reasons that we have to do this, but right. I wanted to try to alleviate any additional burden as much as possible. Okay, well, thank you. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, that was all I had on questions under business services, under educational services. Item eight, um, first reading of amended board policy discussion regarding the following amended board policy BP 5145.12, search and seizure. Um, the, again, this is the first reading, we won't be voting on it. Um, and it's a discussion item, so Dave, we, we have several speaker cards. Do you want to start? I would like to, okay. I, have, I have some information for you on Okay, that. thank you. Um, so am I locked out of this right now? No, uh, should it be? So the, the first reading of this board policy is motivated by some of the campus behavior that we have as a challenge that's been going on in an increasing amount over the last couple of years. Um, the amount of suspensions and expulsions related to substance use, particularly marijuana, has had a significant rise over the last few years. And in a few moments, we're going to show you some, there it is. As we look in this first column, far left, that entire school year, we had 54 students district-wide for the entire year that were suspended for a 4900C event that's relating to substance use on campus or possession or under the influence. As you see, as we look at the last two full school years of data, 09, 10, and 10, 11, those numbers have doubled and almost tripled in terms of suspensions district-wide. As we look at our numbers in the junior high level, going from eight to 41, that's an increase of, of five times. That's a, a significant increase for us in terms of what we're seeing with students. Um, as we look at some of the other data here, breaking down 09, 010, and 10, 11, in grades seven through eight, we took the suspensions that were 4900C, 
In 0910, you see there are 18, 17 of those 18 were marijuana related. And as we look at the 010, 11 numbers of the 41 events, 30 were marijuana related. And we look at the high school, 9 through 12, district wide, 118, 48900 C events, 101 were marijuana related, and 72 of 86 um, last year. When we look at data for this year, in terms of the first 69 days of the school year, last year there were 52 marijuana related events district wide, resulting in 250 days of suspension and seven expulsions. This year we're seeing again a significant increase, almost triple the amount of expulsions based upon substance use. Um, district wide, we have many different programs for prevention Red Ribbon Week, um, the McDowell Drug Task Force, Project Success, many of our speakers. Um, project alert that happens in the PE classes. Um, even our challenge day curriculum talks about this type of thing. Um, Nightmare on Puberty Street at the junior high schools. There are a myriad of different events. One of the big things that we're, we're um, challenged by now is the more liberal marijuana use laws and the provision of marijuana through um, prescription recommendations that take place. Many of these events that are taking place on our campuses involve family or friends that have medical marijuana cards and the students have greater access to that and thus there's greater use, there's a greater supply on the street that's out there for a lesser amount and it really impacts this, the overall attitude of substance use that we have. The thing anecdotally that goes along with that is that we have a multitude of students that are facing discipline consequences such as expulsion as well as truancy issues that are involved in substance use on a regular basis. This is a significant problem for us in the district. We're always looking for other preventative measures, and we know with our great relationship with law enforcement, Pedalum Police, their presence on campus was also a big factor. And when we don't have the SROs there, we miss out on that. This new board policy, the way it's written, gives us an opportunity to have Pedalum Police on our campuses to a greater amount. We would like to have them come and do assemblies and show the students and, and families if they want to see it what these drug detection dogs can do and show them that there may be some point, some random days throughout the school year that these drug detection dogs might be on the campus inspecting a variety of different places. By no means do we want this to be a gotcha issue. We want it to be a prevention piece. We want them to know that this is something we're paying attention to the law enforcement community is committed to it, the school board is committed to it, and hopefully we can get support from families and community members that will support this addition to our board policy. Thank you. I have several speaker cards. First is Linda Shaley. Would you please come forward? I was going to say, I live at 333 Casa Grande. <laughs> That's not quite true, but it's close. <laughs> Dave asked me to come speak to you tonight a little bit about what impact it has on the schools for us to have to investigate so many of these marijuana suspensions. And so I thought, well, I'm not particularly a numbers person, but I was curious about what exactly is the impact? What's, what's the term uh, in, in terms of man hours? How much of our time are we spending on this? Sometimes it seems like we spend all day on it, because we do. Um, so 70, 77 events in the first 69 days of the school year. So for each event, you have an administrator, generally an assistant principal, but sometimes me on a busy day, um, <coughs> investigate for, I would say, a minimum of an hour, including the parent contact, talking to the student, doing a backpack search, if there are multiple students involved, it can stretch into a half a day or more, but let's just say an hour. We have a campus supervisor generally assisting us for at least part of that time. We always want two adults present anytime we're searching a backpack, so a half an hour of a campus supervisor's time. Our discipline secretary then writes up a report, makes contact with the parents to set up a discipline hearing. We always require a site hearing for a student to come back after a five-day suspension, and it's almost always a five-day suspension for marijuana use. The discipline secretary enters the information in Aries, writes the report, sets up a side hearing with Dave Rose, 
generally emailing back and forth about that to see a time that he can come, because Dave is always present at these as well. So let's just say conservatively half an hour of her time. Teachers then preparing lessons for a student who is being suspended for five days. Average student has six teachers, let's say roughly speaking conservatively an hour to prepare lessons for a student for five days of being out of school, grading that uh, work when it gets returned times six teachers, so let's say six hours. Discipline hearing then is held before the student comes back. That's a half an hour of the administrator's time, half an hour of Dave Rose's time, half an hour of the counselor's time. So for each student who is suspended for marijuana use, we're talking about approximately nine and a half man hours. That is 1,827 man hours each year at the current rate we have of suspending students. That's a significant amount when you think that the average person who works a full-time job works 2,000 hours a year, right? The student misses five days of school. That's 1,500 minutes of instruction lost that they will never regain. Again, at our current rate, that's 80,500 minutes, instructional minutes a year lost to students for marijuana suspensions. The job of keeping our campuses clean continues to get harder. Dave mentioned some of those reasons. Medical marijuana, I can drive down 101 and see a big boat board telling me exactly where I can go to get it, and I don't need much of an excuse. I have a hangnail, I can probably walk out with a medical marijuana card. Many of our students get their marijuana at home. It's um, been four years since we lost our school resource officers on campus, and that is a loss that we are still feeling at an increasing rate. Societal message is that marijuana is really no big deal, probably safer than drinking and driving, right? Um, I had the honor of judging freshman debates in public speaking for a semester for final exams, and one of the debates was pros and cons of marijuana use. And one girl stood up with a lot of conviction and said, I can tell you for sure, marijuana is no big deal. In fact, my mom is a nurse. She's very successful, and she uses marijuana several times a week. <laughs> so I wanted to say, can you please tell me where she's a nurse, because I really don't want to go there. But the fact of the matter is, this young woman believed, because of her personal experience, that marijuana use was really no big deal. In fact, my mom uses it, and she's, she does really well. My friend uses it, and his, when he stopped using it, his GPA went down. Those were her facts. In addition to that, students are constantly finding better and, and uh, cleverer ways to bring marijuana onto our campus. And, you know, for example, when you look at this, you think, well, I might, I might have a pair of folded up glasses in here or a lipstick, maybe, something like that, right? If I were a teacher and I saw this on a student's desk or in a backpack, I'd think, no big deal, except it has a marijuana pipe in it with a little leftover. This was confiscated from a student at Casa Grande. Everybody needs a highlighter on campus, right? Doing my work, taking notes, highlighting, being a good student, except this particular highlighter has a marijuana pipe inside of it. If you saw this sitting on a student's desk, you wouldn't think twice. This was confiscated from a student at Casa Grande High School. <coughs> you probably have sensed by now <laughs> I feel very passionately about this. We see every day what this does to students, this increased marijuana use. You can bet that after missing five days of school and 1,500 minutes of instruction, students don't just bounce right back. These are not our 4.5 GPA students, although there are some, but generally speaking, these are, not, these are struggling students that we're suspending because we have to, because they're bringing marijuana onto campus. So I think, um, there's, there's no magic cure for this. There's no one thing that we can do that is going to make it all better. Um, it's going to be a combination of a lot of things, um, particularly help from parents. But I do believe, particularly since we don't have SROs anymore, that having these dogs on campus on a random basis, on an occasional basis, educating students, um, allowing the police to forge relationships with our students will make a difference. And I think it's an important difference, and I think it's high time that we took advantage of this. So. Thank you for your time. Thank you. And then my next speaker, Mike Cook. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, my name is Mike Cook. I'm a lieutenant at the police department. One of the jobs that I do is to supervise our canine program. 
So I understand you're considering a policy that will allow you to use drug detection dogs in the schools as a prevention strategy. Um, we try as hard as we can to work with the schools in any way we can. And for that reason, we're willing to consider almost anything on, on a prevention strategy or basis. Uh, to echo, echo some of the things that have been said, we are seeing just a tremendous increase in the use of marijuana. Uh, the laws surrounding marijuana are a complete quagmire. Uh, there are many unintended consequences from that law. Uh, almost, you'd have a hard time finding anyone at the police department who would take an issue with a uh, patient actually needing medical marijuana uh, to treat an illness, but that's not what we're seeing. Uh, we see that, but then we also see a dramatic increase in the availability of marijuana, the abuse of that law, and uh, an increase in dealing both to adults and to children. We, the numbers actually are skewed a little bit because they're growing and our statistics are going up as far as marijuana related incidents, but there are a lot more that aren't even statted because the law is so fuzzy that generally you just default on the side of not statting or not making an arrest or having to deal with it in some other fashion. So just anecdotally, uh, both in the schools and around the schools, after school, in the evening, parties, cars, tremendous increase in the amount of young adults uh, and kids, actually, with access to marijuana and using it. And it's created a tremendous problem for us on the enforcement end of it. And I know you guys are facing the exact same thing too in the schools. And we don't have a, a, a great solution for it. Uh, I think that law obviously needs to be uh, looked at and corrected, kind of not what we do. We usually deal with the enforcement end of the law, and I can just tell you that it's, it's difficult for us. As the, the dog unit or canine supervisor, what I really want to do is give you a little bit of idea of what, kind of what the drug drug dogs do, just so that you have it when you're making a decision. Because your decision is to institute the policy. The policy will allow you to use either private hired dogs to ask us if we're willing to do it. And as I said, we're willing to consider it. Drug detection dogs, uh, we have actually what are called dual purpose dogs. They are trained in both drug detection and in personal protection. And that's a very different thing than just a drug detection dog. They are tremendously accurate. They are trained uh, with double blind uh, training <coughs> exercises where literally the handler, the dog, and the evaluator don't know where drugs are placed and the dogs time after time go straight to it and detect it. There's a tremendous amount of research and I won't go deep into it, but. Uh, as far as court purposes go, the, the, the dogs are tremendously accurate. They rarely make a mistake and usually uh, when they do have a false alert or a false positive, a lot of times through interviews will show that uh, they alerted, let's say, on a closet door, we won't find anything in there. On follow-up interviews afterwards, we'll interview suspects and they'll say, yeah, I used to keep my drugs in there, but I moved them last week. And the dog can detect what was left there the week prior. So they're tremendously accurate. We don't use our dogs to search people for drugs because they're dual purpose dogs and they do article searches and location searches. So even on the street in an enforcement mode, we don't have our dog physically check people, but we will check cars, containers, homes. That's how we use them. There are dogs, uh, private dogs and some drug detection only dogs that are trained to actually do uh, detection with live people. Uh, we don't do it because it's just not with dual purpose dogs. Though they're highly trained, they're still dogs and we generally don't do the drug detection uh, with people just because of the safety factor. Alerts with the dogs. When a dog finds drugs, what it does is uh, it's either an active alert or a passive alert, and that depends on how you train the dog. The dog, some dogs will train where they find a scent of drugs, they will just sit. 
and that's your indication that drugs are present. Other dogs will actively paw at a location or, you know, or, or a container to indicate that there's drugs in there. Some will give you, there are some other different kinds of alert, but those are the main two. Uh, they never, they don't, they're trained to bite when they find drugs. They're actually reward driven. When they find the drugs, they're rewarded with a toy and that's how they're trained and they actually, to them, it's just another day at work. So, that's kind of, in a nutshell, just a really quick, I know, fast <coughs> outline of what's there. And I wanted to open myself up to questions if you have, when you're while you're considering this policy, questions about the dogs, how they're used, I, I'm certainly I'll take all questions. I guess the only question I have is, to what extent is it, I mean, what is the law with regard to um, probable cause? I mean, Dave, maybe you can walk, between whomever is here. We, we have an attorney here. Yeah. <laughs> oh, very good. Okay. So if we were to bring somebody to the schools, whether it was you, a private company, whatever, we have the right to do that at any time? Is there a noticing thing? How does that whole thing work? Okay. Perhaps we should. Uh, uh, and I actually have a question, question about the dog too, if I could ask. Yeah, ask the question about the dog, and then we can kind of go. Yeah, and it would be great. Well, I, I know Mike to be a brilliant yeah. legal mind, so I just. <laughs> I could also have that answer, but I don't want to show anybody else. So. I chose the easier, easier path. Uh, so go ahead with your questions. So do you do, or have you done, or is the department done some type of like what Dave was talking about, a demonstration? Is there? We do. We do demonstrations. Uh, we're open uh, to considering, you know, the request for a demonstration on what dog capabilities are, um, certainly for you as well while you're making the decision uh, to show you what they're done or what they are capable of. And we're, we're looking at it, you're asking if we're, we'll consider it as a prevention strategy? Absolutely. Have you or any of the dogs had any experiences on school campuses with, with this kind of interdiction? We have not. Uh, other places are experiencing the exact same problems and looking for solutions as well. Uh, I'm actually in the process right now doing some research uh, with other agencies to see what experiences they have. I know there are a few within the state that are doing similar things and uh, I'm actually reaching out to those agencies to find out what their experiences are. Now, are you aware, are there any other uh, as a law enforcement officer, are you aware of any, like, marijuana detection sensors? You know, they have these gas sensors and carbon monoxide. And I'm just asking that. It's a little off the subject, but I'm just wondering if, if we had those kind of sensors in lockers or, or you know, it's my, some of those, some of those <laughs> gas sensors are really cheap. They give them away. I mean, they're like, you know, I'm talking about the no, carbon. I think, I think are you aware of anything like that? I think it's a very fair question and a, a good one. I'm not aware of anything that's practical or as proven uh, reliable as the dog. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and physically, all we have are, as far as an alternative to drugs, we go on site recognition yeah, right. and then portable. We have a portable chemical test to confirm you know, the content of what it is we find. Or just leave a bag of Oreos out there and see who gets them. <laughs> I'm not sure this is an appropriate question mm -hmm. for you. You talked about the police department doing it versus an outside agency that comes in to do it, test dogs. So what happens, do you know, or maybe you might know, what happens when an outside agency that's not a law enforcement agency is a private service and has dogs and they find something on school? Are the police department then called? That's a... How would that... Yeah, it would depend on what we found. Mm -hmm. So if, we, if it was an outside agency, if, if a dog alerted on a locker or a backpack, we'd be required right away to bring the student to that locker or that backpack and say, the dog is alerted on your property, on your backpack. Is there something in there that you shouldn't have or that shouldn't be at school? And we're gonna look through it because we have now a reasonable suspicion to look in this area. Let us know if there's anything in here. Depending on what we find, we could contact the police and ask for them to do an investigation and possibly cite the student. Or we can handle it in-house dealing with suspension and, and our dispositions that we use. And would we have the same option if the police department's there using their dogs? Correct. Correct. 
Yeah, the, dis the discovery would be the exact same for us, the, the same issue, whether you hired a company to do it or um, had, we end up using ours. And then you still have the option of handling it administratively. If you did want to prosecute, then you have to basically do an investigation and try and determine. I think that's possession. one step further than what we're really discussing tonight, but I just haven't mm -hmm. gotten that far mm -hmm. in mind, so it's just good to think about it. Thank you. Sure. Anything else? Okay. Anyone else? All right. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, Mark. And our next speaker, Marco Fong. My name is Marco Fong. I'm the Assistant General Counsel for School and College Legal Services. Uh, a few months ago, Mr. Rose uh, asked me, asked our office to consult on uh, the legality of, of drug, sniffing, drug sniffing dogs in a public school. And he provided the district with a memo, which you should have in your back, um, that essentially says, yes, they are legal, but there are some limits. Uh, and uh, this, uh, let me explain it uh, this way, that um, for an individualized search, you need what is known as probable cause. And that is the reason that the dogs are not generally used to sniff students directly. Um, we are using them uh, to, uh, and, and in terms of a more general search of the building, of desks, of lockers, of any uh, items that the child, the student voluntarily leaves behind. Um, we have, the, the district as a public agency has a right to protect the safety of its students and staff. Uh, so essentially we, the dogs can search lockers with the students away from them. They can search classrooms and desks with, again, with the students not in the classroom. Um, and uh, anything that is found in that search then establishes probable cause to question or search the student himself or herself. Um, the, uh, it sounds like you have a lot of questions, so it, would it make the most sense to just to move to the questions, or? I think, go ahead and continue um, with what you uh, thoughts. You're going to make it harder for me. <laughs> Sorry. Um, an another point, I, and you didn't ask for this, but I just want to clarify, and I, I, I'm sure you probably have um, our updates. I, I believe we did an update a few years ago that um, medical marijuana or having a medical marijuana card does not permit a student to either use or carry on a school campus. Mm -hmm. um, there may be an odd situation where they have third stage cancer or something that's very unlikely and you would need a doctor to specifically say that child needs a drug school hours. Um, the, uh, but essentially, uh, you know, the, the question of arrest and prosecution is entirely separate. Mm -hmm. um, the district has a right to maintain the safety, health of its students and staff. If, uh, if you are, if the dog does um, alert on a student, you know, inadvertently, you know, when the student's passing by, that's an interesting legal question. Um, but uh, that's the reason that we say that the, the dog must be alerted and the alert must be noted only by the dog's handler. Um, and you know, if essentially if you wind up in a plain smell question, we would recommend the administrator calling our office and saying, what do we do here? Mm -hmm. um, you know, if something's out in the open, there's a, uh, an accepted legal doctrine that it's in plain view. So if you have a dog walking through school and the strong smell is so strong, and I don't know if this happens, um, that the dog just starts alerting, you know, randomly, seemingly randomly, uh, then you can probably but those, are, those situations will be very few and far between because the main purpose of this, um, as everyone has said, is preventative. Right. So I have a question. I don't know if this is theoretical or not, but as I read through this policy and it talks about metal detectors, it says in order, and I'm paraphrasing, to ensure a safe school environment, superintendent may make students walk through a metal detector and come into school as long as it's uniform and consistent. 
for much the same reason the courthouse has metal detectors. Okay. So is the difference, but what I'm hearing you say with regard to marijuana is that you can't actually make everybody walk past a drug sniffing dog when they enter school in order to maintain a safe educational environment. And I'm, and I'm questioning, and it's not, and I'm not, not your personal, but what's the difference? Um, I think the difference in the law is uh, frequently one of, well, this one's been allowed by courts and this one hasn't yet. Yeah, you know, obviously there is an interesting argument about that. I think the other one is <clears throat> metal detectors specific for violent acts. Immediate Guns, threat. knives, yeah. and immediate, immediate threat. threat. Yeah. I don't think the courts yet are prepared to say pot's an immediate threat. Tell They're looking at physical safety and harm. That's the distinction as I understand it, at, at least with the courthouse situation and how they got through that. Mm -hmm. uh, it's to keep people from bringing a gun, bringing a gun or a knife or a weapon. Right. Uh, that's correct, but the, the more abstract argument that is Troy doesn't really, yeah. Yeah. isn't it a certain yeah, person. Factor. They're not nuanced. So. Yeah. No. <laughs> that, that's that. Two choices there. So is there any movement afoot in that regard or is it going the other way? These days, uh, the and movement's been strongly way. to allow searches of most kinds. Because when I mean, you look at Dave's numbers and Linda's numbers with regard to the instances and the burden, and you know, safe is has many meanings. So I, I guess I'm just questioning which way we're going on that. I mean, nobody wants to be a test case, but at the same time, I think what Dave's sort of talking about is potentially throwing out this idea that dogs may or may not be there at any given point. Uh, well. The, the dogs may be there, but we're also providing notice to parents and students mm -hmm. prior to the school year or upon enrollment. Right. There is the possibility that dogs will be used for, ser for drug searches. Okay. Okay. Now, Good. is this meaning that the drug searches are actually going to take place while the students are in the classrooms? No. If no. The, okay, so the, the dog will be circulating amongst the students no. as they're walking? No. no. Well, I mean, some yeah. of that's in that. In that. Sergeant, right. I think yeah, right. we'll be able to answer that more. Right. right. They my right understanding away. is they wouldn't go into a classroom with yeah. just in desks, but while kids are in classrooms at desks, they may be in the hallways and in the locker. You would send all of the students out of the classroom if before the dog the comes in to do the search of the desks. Okay. Um, we would not recommend doing it the other way because then you are creeping into the world of individualized mm -hmm. search without mm -hmm. probable cause. Mm -hmm. But even if you search without probable cause, so you just don't act on it, but when the dog's pawing at him, it's like, well, at least we know who has the pot. We, you just can't act on it, correct? That, I mean, you're not that, detaining the student, you're not artificially arresting anybody. That would be correct, but I, th I think it would, if, if that would started to happen, we would be begging for a complaint with the Office of Civil Rights. Right, okay. Um, that you, I would recommend being, we would recommend being very extremely careful about doing that sort of thing. In, um, in the language, it refers to that we would not use the dogs to to um, sniff out a person, um, but if we had other reasonable suspicion that the person might have... Once you have reasonable individual and suspicion, you. you can go ahead with the search. With, with the search without a dog? Without a dog. Okay, that's um, right. And I would recommend a pat search or something right, like right, that, right. that nature. Um, and then there are procedures for those for sorts of searches. Thing. We even have we even wrote in um, the possibility that someone will do this electronically someday, or use some animal other than a dog because there's talk that pigs, for instance, have more sensitive noses they than actually, dogs. And they're very smart. Yeah. Um, so I suppose search pigs may come into vogue. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes, and we, we can <laughs> develop a side business in California <laughs> truck. <laughs> um, <laughs> the more I think I'm asking. <laughs> But in any case, we, we've tried to, to create a policy that gives you some flexibility. And for instance, we um, added in the, the, the ability of the district to use a breathalyzer on a student if there is right. individualized suspicion. Right. Um, Actually, but, well, we have you here. Can I maybe just go back uh, about eight months to a specific question regarding that? Can we breathalyze students without probable cause to get on a school bus set? I'm going back to grad night. Oh, the dance. Yeah. Remember the grad night question? Mm -hmm. We have advised on it. You have to be. You have to show some uh, 
series of incidents or risks, essentially, that you know, if there were you know, drunk driving arrests or someone died in an accident due to, you know, or that it's gradual due to intoxication. I don't know that, well, you know, we've sort of signed off on that at times, but it's, it's better to have it supported in some way so that we'll, you know, we'll breathalyze every student walking into the dance. I suppose it's, it's, it may be doable. I would, it, the publicity from it would be so extreme that unless you had some reason, you know, specific reason to do it, um, which may be that you had to, you found 12 bottles of Jack Daniels at the last dance. And I'm not necessarily yeah. recommending I'm just, this came up before as an issue with regard to grad night and transporting students there and how to get them there sober and keep them sober. So. Um, Understand. Yeah. He's just hitting you for free legal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I would say that the law is not a fixed thing. I suspect this um, is a break. You know, if you've been, <laughs> been following the gay marriage debate, one right. day it's legal, one day it's not. And right. one day right. It's legal in certain ways. And uh, some of these pre search things, you know, like the metal detectors, have, you know, they may change. Are you aware of anybody else that's doing this now? Um, I know a couple a couple districts in in the county have been exploring it. Um, there's at least one district in Mendocino County. I think there are two districts in Mendocino County that have implemented it. Um, one of them used a private company, and I believe neighboring counties definitely have, other neighboring counties definitely have. Is it okay to do the we'll call it the physical search as opposed to the personal search? The physical search on a random, completely random basis basis without giving like pre-notice say like on the you know the DUI checkpoints you know where they have to give a, the, the police have to give a notice to the public at large that those are coming um, as one of the ways to be able to do that group stop without probable cause so and I know that's to the person but are, are you aware of anything would require pre-notice like read over the laws bigger don't worry kids tomorrow we have a a locker search. Yeah. <laughs> um, then it wouldn't be random. I don't no, no, that's my point. Is that <laughs> okay, the, the DUI. Right. We're talking about a search of the person versus a search of a locker. No, no, no I'm talking no, about, no, I, I understand your point about else. probable cause of the search of the person. I'm saying if we want to do a physical environment search, like you seem to suggest that the dogs could run through an empty classroom or down an empty hallway, do we have to give some sort of notice if we're going to do these random dog searches? Not beyond what you do at the beginning of the year. At least that's been upheld so far. Okay. Yeah. Because okay. otherwise it's not preventative. Exactly. It was. Well, it prevents people from breaking. If you're stoned enough not to hear the warning, maybe we catch you. There. Um, <laughs> well, it's not as effective as. Yeah. Right. 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 Okay. And you know, I, I would. Uh, yeah, there is this balance between sure. having metal detectors and dogs roaming the halls every right. day and maintaining a learning environment. Right. Um, and it likely should remain something that's relatively unusual, but doesn't happen necessarily on any prescribed schedule. Well, I think that, I mean, I think it's good for everybody to say, we'll ask you the question to the extreme to try to find out if there's a balance somewhere in the middle to, to figure out how we address this issue that, unfortunately, as we just got out of closed session, dealt with again tonight, we did deal sure. with every other Tuesday night. We wrote the policy to be, to give you as much, or to give the district and district staff as much leeway as is, you know, is there any case law? Is there has anything actually gone to court? Um, drug sniffing dogs have gone to court. With regard to schools, though, and yes, yes. Um, it, but it, again, it, you know, they've they've upheld generalized searches of the premises, but not of individual students. So far. Okay. Um, I do remember that being the subject of case law is never good. <laughs> you should never strive to be. <laughs> no, don't want your name. Versus somebody. Yeah, you don't want your name in the time. I, I advised on another matter not long ago, where that's kind. Of, that was my point. <laughs> was that you? Um, the last thing you want to be involved in is a civil liberties um, sort of issue that goes to federal district court because you're going to be there for a while. The stakes are unlimited because there's no money on it, and uh, no one. You know, even when you win, you you know. You get to be famous, but nothing else. But you spend a lot of money. Right. Uh, and, and normally you would, I mean, frequently you would get the support of one of the school, you know, CCA, for instance, to support, you know, this, the district's position. Okay. okay.
So in short, more personal searches, theoretically we could bring in a drug sniffing dog when there are no students around to sniff the facilities and whatever may be in the facilities. Yeah, the school can certainly be in session, but the student can't but be next to the physically locker. right there. Yeah. And the other provision we have written in the policy is that a student cannot be forced to leave an item, personal item in the classroom. Right. But if they do, that's essentially fair game. Right. And the assumption is, I, I, to go a little further, um, if something is found in a student's car, or the car that belongs to a student, or the student's locker, or the desk, that essentially becomes a rebuttable presumption that that whatever um, um, what whatever material is in there belongs to the student, or the student has something to do with its being at school. Obviously, if the student has a persuasive story that you know someone else got to their locker or stuck it in there. You, know, you, you, you think that the car is the same as the locker? If it's um, on campus. The car is on campus. on campus. And I don't know if you heard about the, there was a relatively unusual case out of Glen County, I think, where a student uh, had supposedly been duck hunting. And he had the gun in the gun rack in his car. But he parked on the sidewalk outside the school. Mm -hmm. And the, um, the governing board, the, the, I think the county board said, well, that's not school property, so they overturned the expulsion. Mm -hmm. But if it's if it if the car is on campus, then it's subject to search. Um, and you know, it's also subject to questioning for whoever either drove the car or who normally whoever normally brings the car to school. And I suppose you know, if they're in a carpool or something, whoever rides in it. I have a question for the town. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. That was very, very helpful. Staff will, you know, can answer any, get, get any questions from us. Okay, okay. Thank you. They appreciate, don't. appreciate your time. Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm getting the older I get, the harder it is to hear. So. Yeah, no, no. Uh, I have a question. When the dogs are doing the drug sniffing, um, are they on leash still with their handler, or are they off leash? It can or be done. Depend? It can be done either way. Normally on leash, uh, but you can certainly let them go. Just. Kind of clear up one other thing, at least on dog use, you asked about alerts of people going by. Can the dogs be overwhelmed? They can be overwhelmed by scent, but generally it takes a lot. So a U-Haul truck uh, with a hundred boxes of marijuana in it, it might not find the, the cocaine for the overwhelming marijuana. Most of the time it actually will. So they can be overwhelmed, but it's fairly rare. And as far as alerts on uh, persons, the dogs don't just sniff 24 hours a day. Um, they have smells all the time, but they're actually told to search. So the dogs turn on and turn off, if you will, at, at the handler's uh, request. So, you know, when we're out at the fair with our, our dogs, they aren't necessarily sniffing everyone that goes by. Um, They'll start when the handler tells them, go search. And then a question for the two of you. So if we were to pass this, uh, I am assuming that, I don't know if it would be, there would be some further uh, procedure or policy you put in place on who we're going to use and what it's going to cost us. And we'd get to see what, or we'd know what notice you're going to put out to the schools at the beginning of the year. I mean, there'd be for more than just this general, we're OK. You know. The, the details of that will be in the AR, the administrative okay. regulation that will be in the next one. And so as we, as we work those out. Okay. Yep. So this policy talks about dogs may sniff around lockers, desks, or vehicles. So is that around vehicles? In other words, they, and would, they, not normally, they would not normally go, go in. into the vehicle. Okay. okay. And, and, and would a dog smell from the outside, Mike? Absolutely. Really? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. From the outside, to hidden compartments inside. So the old Yosemite bear rule. Doesn't work. Yeah, they, I mean, they'll, they, they're that accurate and, and that good. That's the value. I've got two kids that one through high school and one in high school that never use a locker ever. I don't know, Linda, you tell me, but lockers don't seem to be. Mm -hmm. well, we don't have lockers in Oh, that's right, you don't have lockers in Yeah. I mentioned there's this fascinating case that's pretty recent. It's, it's I think, being reviewed where um, a, a 
drug enforcement agents, took a GPS. The, car, the, the, the suspect's car was parked in a public place. They stick the GPS under the fender, and the court says that's not a search. So. It's actually just changed. Yeah. Oh, did it just change? Just yeah. changed. Yeah, that's right. But, um, it now actually requires a, a search warrant. Yeah. 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 But I'm just talking about how it's yeah. very yeah. fluid. Yeah, yeah and, but that's yeah, a great example of how one day it's okay, the next day it isn't. That is a lot to think about, and it would be nice if uh, we had uh, you know, public awareness of this issue. If there were any concerns by our community, um, it would be nice to get their feedback um, on this, as well as um, to be able to, to look at any other ways in which we can curb um, this growing problem, which a couple of years ago, we had started to see a pattern in our expulsion hearings. Uh, the increased use and it was anecdotal and so we'd asked Dave to please give us a summary of what's been happening and thus the um, slide that you showed earlier we we want to look at all options um, to try to reduce this because clearly it takes uh, a full-time person to process this that's the equivalent 1800 and something hours a school year uh, that's extreme and in our current budget situation, we just can't afford that. And the, the bigger damage is to the students who are missing instructional time. And we have also seen, unlike the report on the um, speech debate, uh, we see a, a core, huge correlation between the use and uh, grades declining. So. It has to be addressed. So, any um, feedback from the public? I just have one other quick question. Uh -huh. I'm not sure oh, of course. It is, but it just yeah. occurred to me yeah. because of something that you said. Differentiate for me, please. A car driven by a student to school parked on school property and not parked on school property because some of our schools have parking that's we don't have enough parking. And it's it's not. I mean, this was just a ruling by a county board of education. Um, I don't think it really made it to real court. Um, but the notion is you can be suspended for activities um, in or at or related to school. Well, it's my understanding we're responsible for the children getting to and from school or that the activities that happen. Jurisdiction. To and Not responsibility, school. jurisdiction. Excuse me. Yeah. And so what we've done, Troy, is when we have a suspicion that a student has possession under the influence or is used in and around their vehicle, we're going to ask them for permission to search and ask them to open it. And if they grant us that permission, that's fine. If they say no and they're under 18, we're then calling the parent and asking the parent. Sorry, and yeah. most typically the parents are giving us permission because they typically don't want their students doing this either. Although actually that exact thing just happened a few weeks ago and we called the parent and the parent said absolutely not. Absolutely not. So for the purposes of this policy, we're talking about the dogs, they said we're on lockers, that's on vehicles on district property or at district sponsored events. Would that relate to a car parked on English? A, a high school student's car parked on English? Not on our property, but clearly their vehicle to go to school that day. We'd have to have a reasonable suspicion that there was something that was creating a threat to campus or students or property. So if Mike's dogs were here sniffing lockers going through the parking lot. It would not extend, that search could not extend to off-campus parking. We always are student parking. I typically wouldn't want to pursue that. Mm -hmm. um, it now, it could the easily. Call for a dance with the I don't mean like what if and then they come back, but I'm trying to find yeah. But if you have strong individualized suspicion that there's a pound of cocaine in that car, it's also a police matter. Exactly. Yes, yeah. yeah. within so their circle. Yeah. I understand. We know specifically at Pullman High School that half the parking on campus is off campus. Right. So does that does that relate to the dogs going through the parking lot? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Yes, thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Take care. Those numbers there. Discussions are like that. Yeah. Okay. Um, <clears throat> any other discussion items? You just are retained, huh, Jim? Uh, item K, future business calendar of activities for board members' consideration and agenda items for our next meeting, which will be held here at 6 p.m. on February 28th. We will, um, our participants are going to have both our real owners and the Federation's real owners and possibly see us relative to um, negotiations. Oh, okay, great. Anybody else have anything you specifically want to? Okay. okay. Um, given that, then we will now adjourn to closed session. Thank you.